we ready to begin? Good morning! My name is Misty. Come on, Ike, it's time. We would be honored if you would join us. The greatest adventure of all time. Yeah. We just become best friends. Yep. Come on, let's get in the character. Hey, hey, Misty. Hey, hey, Isaac. How's it hey, hey going? It's, hey, hey, we're the Misty and Isaacs. Can't you see we're monkeying, monkeying around? Monkeying around. We're too busy singing. Our intros are the best. To let anybody down. Yep. We are. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys. And people say we're monkeying around. I wish we'd played music for we're all 200 million. Singing. Episodes so far. I know, but we've been in so much trouble. I know. We've been playing a lot of music. I mean, fair use has to come into play at some point. Some point. Like, come on. We ain't making any money off of it. No, we're not. And we're we're commentating on what we're playing. Yes. Hello. I'm Ike the commentator, and this is Misty. We are commentating on what we're playing. So stop getting us in trouble on the platforms for playing the things. We're just showcasing and 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 we are um, we're learning more about the things that we're playing so yeah we're using it for reference educational reference we are today we're gonna educationally reference ourselves about the monkeys that's right we're just monkeying around <laughs> so on this day this is the day that someone placed an ad in the new york daily something yep news um I don't think it was that. Okay. Asking for, you know, musicians to build a band. Um, it was the New York Daily Variety, and it attracted 437 young men that were interested in forming the world's first manufactured boy band. Hmm. So it was a band put together by a manager and a label. Okay. Yeah. Did you know... That of the four monkeys, mm-hmm. only Peter Tork and uh, Mickey Dolans appeared in every episode of the TV show. I did not know that. I thought all four of them appeared in every episode. You would think, but don't worry. The other two had good excuses. Davy Jones had to be written out of an episode so he could attend his sister's wedding. Okay, fair. Michael Neesmith missed three shoots due to a tonsillectomy, the birth of his son, Jonathan, and a oh. family trip to Texas. Okay, that's so wholesome that it just, it's fine. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when you give me something wholesome like that, I can't even shoot holes in it. Yeah. It's like he was uh, addicted to crack. Right. And then had right. 42 strippers yeah. at his house. Right. Yeah. No. No. It was, I had to take my family to Texas on vacation. Mm-hmm. That's the cutest. Um, so there was a big controversy when they got started. Um, and the rumors kind of have persisted, like, through the decades. So they were hired strictly as actors to begin with. Because this was a television show. Mm -hmm. All four of them, though, had to have a musical background. So they did and would jam on set when the cameras stopped rolling. So the big controversy was that they did not play their own instruments. That's not true at all. Oh. So Mickey, who only knew guitar when he was hired, quickly picked up a talent for the drums when they started their first world tour. Wow. Wow. Mike said in a closing interview in one of their episodes, I'm fixing to walk out of here in front of 15,000 people, man. If I didn't play my own instrument, I'm in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So all of them actually did know how to play instruments. I man, Can you imagine? Because yeah. most artists today can't. Right. Or a lot. There's a lot. Some, you know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting that people, I mean, it just kind of proves that even back then, Nobody, like, there's always the naysayers. Always going to be haters. Always going to be haters. You know why we make this show? Because the haters. For the haters. (laughs) We make it for the haters. I don't think we have haters. Oh, we do. Oh, That's how you know you're successful is when you get haters. Well, Because the the more episodes we make, because it comes out every single day. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah. In the morning. Almost every day. On all kinds of platforms. Yeah. Like. Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Google Play. (laughs) The haters will say we didn't get to 300. But we did. But we did. We did. Yeah. Hate on haters. Mm-hmm. Um, here's something I just learned. Jack Nicholson wrote their bonkers 1968 psychedelic movie. Um, I'm sorry. What? Yes. This Mad Cat movie was a colossal flop at, the, at the time. Pocketing a mere $16,000 at the box office. In the five oh. de- decades since, Head's dark, surprisingly political tone has made it a cult classic and mm-hmm. one of the most emblematic films of the late 60s 
Its non-linear structure and surrealism would profoundly influence MTV videos. Jack Nicholson and director Bob Raffleson were the brains behind the postmodern hijinks. Nicholson reportedly hammered out the screenplay on acid. I my mind is blown right now because I've seen bits and pieces of it. Yeah. I've seen like YouTube clips of that movie and it's it's out there. Mm-hmm. Like real out there. Yeah. Wow. Well. That's um <laughs> So they didn't have traditional trailers when they were shooting. Oh, really? This is so mean, I think. For the second season, the studio created a space where the four members can hang out without their antics getting in the way of setting up shots and preparing scenes, which you can do that. Sorry. Even if they have regular trailers. Yeah. Instead of ordinary trailers, they literally built a huge black box with a lighting system that signaled them when they were needed on set. They could play loud music and make as much ruckus as they wanted until it was time to get to work. That's not bad. I mean, they're obviously not rolling sound when the boys aren't on set. Right, but like they're trapped in a black box. Here's something else. Not every show, not not every talent on every show gets a trailer. Some yeah. stages, like especially sitcom stages, mm-hmm. have rooms built onto the stage. Yeah, totally. But that would be fun to have a big old room that just the light goes off when it's time to come to set. I, think. I don't know. I have times that I need to step away. Like I need to not like to get in the right headspace or something. I need to not be around a bunch of people. But if you're like four young boys in a band, that's true. You just want to be around each other and mess around all the time. God, boys are so stupid. Boys are dumb. <laughs> um, Mickey and Michael both auditioned to play the Fonz on Happy Days. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's so funny. There is no bigger what if surrounding Happy Days than the potential casting of Arthur Fonzarelli. The creators were keen on Dolan's and even Henry Winkler thought his chances were slim when he spotted this adorable pop star at an audition. He was pretty cute. Excuse me. But it came down to inches. Six of them, Dolan's was deemed to be too tall, towering over his co-stars. Neesmith also auditioned and was considered too tall. The 5'6 Winkler fit the frame. And he is a freaking national treasure, he, that he, man. You have stories about him. I right? have, he is just the loveliest human on the planet. I have never seen someone so just excited about life and stuff and everything. And he's fantastic. Um, well, Mike, your friend, the tall one who couldn't be the Fonz. My boy, Mike. Um, so very tall Texan. Showed up for his interview in the middle of the hot California summer, wearing his trademark wool hat that he wore in the show. But he also carried in a laundry bag because when he got done with the interview, he was on his way to go do his laundry at a laundromat. Oh, interesting. His casual demeanor and quick wit sealed the deal, and they actually asked him to be on the show that day. They were like, you're the one. You're it. Huh. Yeah. (laughs) Man, um, I'm about to blow your mind twice. Uh, you have already a couple times. Are you familiar with Moog synthesizers? Uh, yes. Most people pronounce them Moog. Yes, sure. Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones Limited is the first album to feature a Moog synthesizer. Wow. Yeah, that's not bad, right? Um, ah. Dolan's owned one of the first 20 Moogs ever sold. They were, that is so cool. They were huge. They were bigger than our sign right here yeah. back in the day. They oh, would come they in a truck. They were enormous. Yeah. 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 Are you ready for the second thing that will blow your mind? I don't, like, I don't even, I'm not sure. I don't even know how to answer that. This is, I don't know, to me, kind of the coolest thing that we're going to learn about today. Okay. But I also haven't scrolled to the end of this thing. Michael Neesmith's mom invented correction fluid. White out? Yes. So this you, is like Romy and Michelle's high school reunion when she says that she created post-it notes. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like what? Can you imagine like getting on a show? You're all set. You're going to be famous for life now, and then your mom just invents something that's going to be a billion-dollar item. Oh, wow. Betty Neesmith Graham whipped up the first batch of liquid paper in her kitchen in 1951, originally calling the stuff "mistake out." Her correction fluid would that's be so a cute. godsend for typists. The rival Whiteout would come along in 1966, just like the monkeys. That wow, mistake out. That's really cute. Oh, so I guess she invented it um, before he got famous. Yeah. And I wonder if the rival. Wait, and which one's mom was that? Michael Neesmith's. Okay. Okay. Or Neesmith. It's plural. It's a possession of his mom with Neesmiths. So 
Mickey and Peter both directed episodes of the monkeys. Mickey also penned the story for the series finale, the Frodo escaper. While Peter took the home behind the scenes in the episode, the monkeys mind their manner. Um, Peter used his full name in the director's credit for the episode. Peter H. Torkelson. Peter H. Torkelson. Peter H. Torkelson. <laughs> and then Mike wrote Linda Ronstadt's first hit. Before the series started, he recorded a solo album under the name Michael Blessing, which featured a tune that would later become a hit for Linda Ronstadt and the Stone Ponies called Different Drum. You can hear him sing a few lines from the song in the season one episode, Too Many Girls. Dude. They have, they have a lot of stuff. Yeah. Like, they did stuff. Do you know who they most heavily influenced? The Beatles. David Bowie. What? Yep. David Bowie named himself after a knife because of Davy Jones. What? Bowie was born David Robert Jones and went by Davy Jones in his early formative <sighs> rock and roll days. He, <sighs> he changed his name to avoid confusion with the Monkey star and picked Bowie based on frontiersman Jim Bowie and his epimonious knife, the Bowie knife. Wow. Yeah. These guys really rock some pop culture, man. Well, okay. This one is going to also blow your mind. They outsold the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. I've heard that. I've heard that before. In 1967, their album outshined two of the biggest names in the music industry when their sales topped both the British band's output combined. Wow. When you combine the sales of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones in 67... The monkeys outsold both of them combined together. That's insane. Wow. Mm -hmm. Speaking of album sales, I'm reading this as we go. The new monkeys album was the best selling CD on Amazon, which is weird. Good Times was the first monkeys recording in decades and saw Dolan's, Neesmith, and Torque collaborating with musicians like Noel Gallagher of Oasis and Rivers Cuomo of Weezer, your favorite guy. The great throwback album also included a posthumous contribution from Jones on a Neil Diamond written tune, Love to Love, which was cut in 1967 and originally intended for the Headquarters album. Wow. Yeah. I have a weird fact for you. Good, because I only have one left. <clears throat> so there is a persistent rumor throughout the years that... A certain notorious cult leader was among the young men who responded to the casting ad in 65. I've heard this. I think I've heard this. However, it's impossible considering he was already serving a sentence in a federal prison at the time. That man was Charles Manson. Right. He did not audition for the monkeys the way that people seem to think that he did. Be a whole lot cooler if he did, man. <laughs> <laughs> um. So the, the movie that they made that Jack Nicholson wrote, did yep. you know... Did did you say this and I missed it? That he also made a cameo in it? Oh, I didn't see. I didn't say that part. Okay. So he became friends with them through their producer, Bob, and helped co-write the movie. And then um, he actually has a cameo role in it. Oh. Which is super weird. So weird. Are you familiar with the original Star Trek series? Uh, yes. With the Leonard Nimoy Yes, he plays William Spock. Shatner. Well, yes, correct. Okay. Yes. So the creator of that original series, his name is Gene Roddenberry. Yes. He based Pavel Chekhov, who is the guy who would like steer the ship. Okay. On Davy Jones. Okay. After the first season of the greatest sci-fi show of all time, Roddenberry realizes he needed a young mop top character to lure more teenagers. Walter Koenig has said his iconic character was modeled after Davy Jones. Okay. That's very, I, I'm trying to weird. picture that character and I'm like, hmm, that's yeah. weird. It's, I think that comes more, the headline's a little misleading. I think the actor kind of based his performance on being a silly mop top. Well, I am going to take us out on one that will tie us back to an episode that we did last week. Okay. They're banned from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh. The co-founder of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Jan Winner bases his refusal to admit them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on the fact that they were hired as actors, not musicians, despite the fact that they have critical acclaim and supporting all of their musical achievements. And they've advocated on their own behalf. And 
Peter has called Jan's actions an abuse of power. And they still have not been able, even though they were able to outsell the Beatles and the Rolling Stones combined, cannot, they will not let them be admit, admitted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Inducted. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that crappy? Yeah. You want to know how much money they made? I do. The Monkees, uh, this is from, this, I, this is Peter Tork's net, network. The Monkees gave me $450 a week for the first year and $750 a week for the second year. We probably make about $20,000 a year in royalties on the Monkees, which when you think that they sold 70 million records is not a lot by today's standards, but it's a lot more than a lot of people take home for a year's work. This must have been written in 1492. <laughs> Uh, but the net worth total, if you go guy by guy, uh-huh. Michael Neesmith, $50 million. Uh, Mickey Doltz, $9 million. Dolans. Yeah. Dolans, sorry. Mm-hmm. Peter Tork, uh, they say he's got $4 million. And, and Davy Jones passed away. Yeah, right? we should do him real quick, though. But we're running out of time. Davy Jones net worth. 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 $5 million. All right. So Michael must have written all the stuff because he had the um, 50 million. I believe that Michael actually had a pretty lucrative career after the monkeys that he did some pretty interesting things and that's where he made his money. Maybe we'll do an episode just on him. It, he's a pretty interesting guy. We, we probably should. Well, let's stop monkeying around and get out of here. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. I'm out of coffee. <laughs>